the earliest piece of music that made me, uh, I guess, really listen to music, shamefully, was um, my dad's Cliff Richard <laughs> album, which I've been uh, blazed for a few times for uh, for listening to. But um, yeah, I remember just listening to it, thinking, "Wow, that's a really cool song." And I think I was about five or six, and he also had ABBA and Queen, so you know, very you know, extremes of pop. Um, I remember just listening to it in a way that I tried to explain stuff to my brother or my mum. Oh, you know, can you hear this? Oh, did you hear that part? And you know, they weren't understanding, but you know, what I was talking about. But I didn't know what I was talking about. But I, I seem to remember that started from that point listening to music in a slightly different way. But I wasn't playing or, or writing for twelve years after that. But I think that was my earliest memory. Yeah. So, so even at that point, you were picking out pieces of the music rather than just listening to yeah. almost as background yeah. music. Yeah, that's 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 my earliest memory of music. Is is that mm -hmm. is listening to to something and thinking, wow, there's there's something else going on because most people we either listen to, you know, the, the beat or or the vocals. And I remember just listening to like scrapey guitars and you know swooping noises and stuff. What I bought with my first paycheck when I was fourteen was. Uh, they had a, uh, an old copy of Smiles of Teen Spirit. That was 1994, so it had been in there for a while. I don't know whether it was a rarity or not, but I remember buying Smiles of Teen Spirit on CD, and at the same time I bought uh, Train of Consequences by Megadeth, so it was a bit of a... and I was really into my metal as well. But yeah, that, that's, that was the first two records I bought. Everybody seemed to be, luckily, into... It was either rave or rock and metal, and uh, a few people had guitars in the houses, and that's kind of where we fell into it. Um, me and my brother, and it was a mainly what we were all into at that point was you know metal and that. But it was, you know it was good. Did it feel like sort of being part of a gang or something? It did, yeah. Ravers and metalers. Yeah. yeah like, you know, it, was, it was it was quite rivalry at some point, but none of us could really play. And you know those kids were all you know listening to what they were listening to. But yeah, it, it was a bit it was a bit gangy, which was good. Yeah, it kind of felt like a bit of a community in a village that you know didn't have anything other than a green. How did you find the music? How, how did you oh, seek out the stuff? Oh I see, oh Kerrang magazine yeah. and there was a Raw magazine at the time um, and Enemy every week on the way to school going to the news agents and buy the copies and uh, just check out what was going on and obviously you know compare notes with other people that may have you know heard something somewhere else on the radio or something. Oh, this is, it sounds really easy. It felt like I, it felt like I liked it better because I, I really had to, you know, I, I, all I had was the CD, and you'd read the booklet ten times, you know, and you never got to see the videos until way later, so I felt like, you know, it was like, yes, I really like this kind of thing. Um, is it too easy to get music now, then, do you think, and it's devaluing it? Yeah, it's, it has devalued it, because it's so easy. It's just a shame that everyone assumes that musicians do something for free. Yeah, it costs them money to record, or money to make a video or something, but, oh, you're a musician, oh, you must, oh, yeah, you'll do it for nothing. Ah, no. No one wants to pay to see that kind of thing. Oh, you're in a covers band, we'll pay you. So yeah, it is. You know, it has devalued it. It's it's a weird system, isn't it? It's mm. um, if you're making original music, um, you could hit the jackpot or most likely earn nothing at all. Mm. Uh, if you copy somebody else's music, there's a living to be made. Mm. That seems a bit. Seems well. Everybody wants to hear a song they know, I guess, at parties. They don't want to hear, you know, who you're in love with. They want to, you know, listen to a famous song, but. I don't know what you can do. My first band was 16 when I started going to gigs because you really get a taste for you know seeing when you see live music up close. And um, a few friends of my in my uh, classes at school have you know Bourne's a bass player and guitar. And you think maybe we should do a little band, and that's pretty much where that started. And what was your first band called? Disclaimer, I think. Oh, that's not bad. No, it was all, it was okay. I think even maybe uh, yeah. no, no. I tell you, I joined. I joined a group of people that had a band called Kitchen because they rehearsed in the kitchen. <laughs> That's terrible. But. Uh, your songs at this point sounding like the people that you were listening to. Yeah, definitely. Right. That mean too much, I'd say. You know, because I guess as you get older and you play with different people, you you know you pick up different things and you go off in different directions. But at the time, they were just carbon copies of Nirvana and uh, and all the other bands we were listening to then. Because I kind of left metal behind because I couldn't play it. So I get went with grunge and then went with pop. Is that because metal is actually a lot more complex than people? Metal, yeah, metal is, uh, is people that can play it. There's people that can play it and then there's people that can really play it. And people that can really play it is absolutely unbelievable musicians. And people that say like, oh, he's just screaming. Okay, well, you try screaming for half an hour, you know, endlessly and see how well you get on. That's a skill, that's a real skill. But, you know, metal's the hardest music and a lot of people think that, you know, they can do it. 
and it, and they yeah, it takes years. Mm -hmm. But you know, obviously, playing three chords on a guitar and writing a pop song, not to you know put it down the scale, is a lot easier. You know, but the songs are harder to write. I think the more simple they are. I actually think a lot of musicians think the same way, don't they, about metal? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it gets a lot of it does get a lot of stick, and I, I know I'm not I'm not one to say that I don't give it a lot of stick metal because it normally comes with a lot of you know lifestyle. You know, you have to you look and you sound and you know it sometimes gets a little bit tedious. You know, but um, I think it's definitely it is the, it requires the most amount of skill. To do. And then I moved on to drums because there was a band in the village again that didn't have drums. I could kind of play. Then yeah, that was the next band, uh, but that that was where it really kind of became clear of what style I was wanting to do, which is more the rock, poppy kind of thing. And my all-time favourite band are called the Wild Hearts. Um, they're really, really great uh, British pop, pop rock, pop songs. Some of them are really heavy, but they're still pop songs if you, you strip it down. And a band called Curb Dog, which um, really stylised my type of playing in tunings and stuff, you know, to make you, you know, yeah, Nirvana, Wild Hearts, Curb Dog, those kind of bands, they're all, you know, songy song type bands, even though they might be heavy or soft, they, you know, it's all about, you know, playing the big chords and having the big choruses. I'd say my first proper band was a band called Volta, and it was 2000. Um, one to about 2004, and we did. Uh, you know, that's the first time I went to a proper recording studio. Uh, 2001. Um, I've done studios before, but they were just kind of like little setups sort of that 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 I had or um, other people had. Because my first band that I joined, that disclaimer band, one of the guys had a four track, right. and that's really where my you know recording bug came from. Uh -huh. So yeah, I, uh, my first proper band was Volta, um, and that went on. To, uh, this went on for a few years, and we got a manager in London, and we went down to you know EMI and did some great wow. things. Yeah, it was it was cool. I mean, it was only yeah. demoing, but it was very exciting. Mm. And obviously, you think you know, being young, oh, this is it. A uh, drummer, uh, we had several drummers, but the last, but one drummer we had, I think, yeah, uh, his dad, a side of his family uh, in London, had this this guy, who became our manager, and he worked for a company called Effects. Which rented out really high-profile gear to you know big shows around London and big gigs. Well, down to anybody really, but they had everything to cater for everything. And he had a lot of ins with lots of record labels because obviously he was renting gear to them. Mm. So he got us in with quite a few people. So the first kind of kind of ooh, kind of it's happening was 2003 when he said, you know, EMI September. These are the dates. Kind of thing. That was the first kind of. What, go down and perform? Go down and play and record in the studios, yeah. Wow. Mm. What studios were you recording? They were a side studio to Abbey oh. Road. Uh, they had the, the, obviously Abbey Road and then they had uh, a, a separate building which they did the kind of demo in. It was a gorgeous place but um, it was just basically to see if they liked us. And the best way to just, you know, is to either go and see you or to work with them. And at that time I guess they just wanted to get us in for a couple of days and see what happened. So how old were you at this point then? 23. And just about having all the dreams laid out in front of you, how, how was you and the band feeling about oh, this bit? I mean, half of the band were kind of like, oh, I don't know, we'll see what happens. And half of us, including me, were like, you know, this could be it. But, you know, it was just a demoing thing. It was just, you know, a really good learning curve. Um, so it didn't come to anything then? No, it didn't come to anything. Uh, what was the disappointment like? No, disappointment, I don't think there really was any disappointment. It was more... I think because they took so long to finish it, I guess they had you know lots of these things going on. They took so long to finish it. How long did it take to finish? About two or three months, and we were only there for two days. Right. And that's like either that it was a less of a priority, or maybe they just had a big backlog. I don't know. But is, is that how record companies work? Do you think that going on? Yeah, I think it is going on. What a record I've worked on a couple of years ago, which is they've got a lot of A-list people on it. You think this is going to be a really fast process? I did the recording. Did the mixing, did the mastering, off it went, and then a year later, oh yeah, we'll put that out now, kind of thing. It takes ages. I don't know. I, I have no idea why. Right. Especially in the like when you know record labels really need to be making money, you know, because they're losing so much because of you know the internet. You think they get their records out there, especially ones with you know high profile people on, but. No, I think they really do take their time. So it's just a culture of taking time, probably from every level of the record industry. I, I, I guess so. Only from my experience. Yeah. I mean, I mean, them. You know, I've, I from, guess there. I guess there have been bands that have just gone in, knocked it out, got a deal, and it's gone, right. and it's straight on the shelf. I'm sure that's like that. 
in somewhere, but I've not experienced it. Right. So it's, uh, for any up and coming artist that's in that situation, then uh, oh, sometimes if time is passing, it's not all over. It's oh yeah, just uh, just carry on with what you're doing yeah. and ignore that and wait wait for the yes or no. I guess yeah. don't put all your eggs in that basket. Just keep going and doing what you're doing. And most people seem to be doing it on their own now anyway. Mm. Do you think it's a negotiating ploy as well? Maybe that if they go in two days later, then they then the band think we're really hot. Uh, whereas if they've waited a couple of months, then they're probably a bit more pliable by then. Maybe, maybe yeah, you can mould them a bit easier. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah that's a, I've never thought of it like that, but that's, that's a pretty good way of looking at it. Yeah, let them stew. Mm. Yeah, then we can mould them. And then they'll be grateful instead of feeling like they're the hottest property on yeah. the block. Yeah, knock the egos out of them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, you know, every band I've ever been in or worked with, you know, everyone has a degree of ego as part of being an artist, I guess. But yeah, that's, that's a really good way of looking at it. Yeah. Let them stew. Uh, I had a side project at the same time called Girl Friday, which was one of the girls that was in that band, and it was okay. And we kind of carried on with the same manager, and it never really amounted to anything. We did a few showcases, but you know, it wasn't really. I don't think it was really where you know my heart was. It was. I loved it, but it, you know, I really wanted to get back into like harder rock kind of things, um, which was the band that followed after, called uh, Ex Pedestrian, which included. Um, it was kind of a band that was like handpicked. I want to work with you, and I want to work with you, and I want to work with you. Instead of these are the people that we have, right. let's let's make a band. Um, but yeah, that was that was good fun. And I went to the complete extremes and did loads of prog with them. And it, you know, get to the point where you wouldn't even remember your own songs. They were that complicated. <laughs> it was like you like being part of a team. Oh, that's amazing! I love being yeah. part of a team. It's great because you can share something. And at the end of it, you know, you either go, you either all feel that it was good or it isn't, and then you can work out quickly why it wasn't and make, make it right. Or if you're on your own, you kind of. You know, bash into a wall a few times before you work it out. Right. But yeah, I, I like being. It's, it, it's good to be in the noise of people. Right. I find that I do lead only in the sense that because that's my job with mm. music is like listening to all, everything. Yeah. Instead of just doing my thing and then working out, you know, different parts, I end up just listening to everything in layers and then just kind of doing more suggestive things like, oh, what about this? What about this? What about this? But I, just, I think that just comes with the job. Mm. Um, Maybe it's in my in my nature. I don't I don't really know because I've been doing this for so long. That I just seem to take that kind of producer role, mm. even though we just you know rehearsed. After that was uh, Age, which was a singer from Expedestrian, and a second bass player in Expedestrian, and a couple of other lads from from Eversham. That was a real hand-picked band of let's write some awesome epic rock pop songs. That we don't care whether anyone likes it again. We don't care whether anyone likes it. Um, we just want to write what we want to write. But let's just stick to big, big hooks, overproduced, crazy, just wall of sound. Um, and that's still going. And that's just I like I like being in in the bands that I'm in now for the sense of there is no there is no goal. We just keep doing what we want to do. Uh, if you set out to make it or you set out to you know sign yourself to something, you end up just picking holes. I think because you. You see it you know, as a time, you know, a time frame. I think sometimes people should stop calling themselves certain things when they've had loads of different member changes. Just start something new, because you know it's like I guess it's like being in, in a relationship. You know, you, you know, you gotta you gotta call it quits sometime and, and, and move on if it's not, you know, if it's falling apart all the time. But yeah, uh, I think with band names, you know, it's just a it's just a label, isn't it? As long as you're getting on with everyone, yeah, I guess it's all right. It's just that sometimes I feel like, uh, and as I said, I'm not criticising them trying to explore it is sometimes it might have been five years on a local scene and just about everybody at least locally knows that band and then sometimes it looks like they've just changed the name and that that old band's gone it feels like a lot of work's oh, got yeah. a lot of gigging and a lot of work's gone into yeah I'm not changing that, that yeah I, okay I get yeah I'm not a fan of that at all mm. if you've got a body of work you know don't I know I know quite a lot of bands uh, and, it, and it's really frustrating they have a style and they get one and then Ditch. No, forget that. Scrap. Done. I mean, sometimes it's good because you find you really find something that you're better at, mm. and you just start fresh. That's that's cool. But the whole, you know, just recycling yourself all the time. I mean, what well, you know, it's just because you wrote a song two years ago doesn't mean it's bad. Mm. You know, it could be reworked or whatever. You know, if you change your style, just you know, mold it in. If people have, you know, if you if I've gone out and I bought a record and I go see a band and they don't play anything off that record because it's not new anymore, it's pretty like, yeah. Well, what about what about this? You know. This was wicked. I love this. Can you play this? 